As you know, QIA stands for Professional Organization of Iranian Americans in Atlantic. QIA is an affiliate of Carnot and is a non religious, non political, and purely an independent organization, independent cultural organization or professional organization. I have the honor of being the president of QIA, which has a border directive different from that of Carnot. The lectures are all in English so that our Iranian American generations 1.5 and 2, who unfortunately do not know Farsi, can benefit from them. Kuya works tirelessly to uphold the three pillars of its mission. Number one, to provide an opportunity for Iranian American professionals to network and support each other. Number two, to help the next generation of Iranian-American professionals to succeed and prosper. Number three, to promote a positive image and counter the negative media depiction of Iran and Iranian professionals. Please support Puya by donating via Puya.net. Before I introduce our distinguished scholar, I will announce the next two programs. Of course, I'm going to announce them in Farsi. The Shambh Aval August Saat Afternoon Shab Sohanrani Khanme Doctor Zari Tahedi and Nakhde Kitab Shiri Shan Tahat Omane Daman Bakhat Mikeshad Ma Tavasat Khanme Doctor Farah Niyazkar Baqay Doctor Murtaza Jafay. Jum E Chahar August Saat Afternoon Shab Sohanrani Aqay Bishar Afzalzade. تحت عنوان افسانه نجاد آزد. سه شنبه هشت آگست ساعت هفت نمیشه سخنرانی آقای دکتر کیارش آرامش تحت عنوان سعی و اخلاقیات ایرانی. Now I am going to introduce Dr. Jasmine. Dr. Jasmine has a BA in psychology and a BS in sociology from the University of Utah. A master's degree and a PhD in psychology from the University of Georgia. She has been a professor at the University of Tennessee, Auburn University, and is presently a professor at Westchester University of, of uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Her research uh, addresses health and well being in adulthood with a specialization in major. Adultery. She looks at the life experiences from a personal, social, and cultural view and believes that our lives are linked with others and the societies and the culture we come from and live in. She works with the World Health Organization and AARP, coordinating a project on helping create a livable uh, communities for people of all ages and backgrounds. She was also in the group that developed the UN Healthy Decade of Aging 20, 2021 to 2031, trying to understand ways that we can help people live healthy and fulfill uh, lives at every stage of life. She also writes a blog for psychology today, which has more, uh, more, of more than thousands of followers. She has written four books and more than 50 research articles on well, well-being in adulthood. In the spring of 2023, she was a visiting scholar at uh, Frederick Alexander University in Germany, where she worked on a project on loneliness among older immigrants to Germany. Thank you so much, Dr. Tahmasev, for accepting our invitation uh, for, you know, from, uh, on behalf of Kuya uh, and Connor. I thank you uh, immensely for actually giving us this opportunity. And uh, thank you so much, and we are all here. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. I'm looking forward to
presenting some information and maybe having some conversation and some questions. I have some slides. Um, I'll go ahead and share those. And I will try to keep the conversation, uh, the presentation in a conversational, casual tone so that hopefully we can have some conversation towards the end with some suggestions from you and some questions and answers um, from me, but also from you. So I would look forward to your suggestions. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Um, okay, so uh, for some reason I cannot see you, but as long as you can see the screen, that's fine. Um, so the, pro the conversation tonight, the talk is going to focus on the many faces of loneliness. I have been doing research on loneliness for about uh, 15 years. Um, I've done a project called the Loneliness Project, where we've looked at loneliness and isolation among different populations in the United States, in Germany, and uh, also in some countries in South America and Turkey. So it's been a very interesting global project. Um, I'll share some of the information with you today. Um, Loneliness is a, really a health crisis, a global epidemic. It started before the COVID-19 epidemic, and of course, COVID made it much worse. Most recent numbers show that 30 million people in the United States say that they are always lonely. That's almost 10% of the population. The Young adults seem to be the loneliest, with 70% saying that they are lonely regularly. In my own area of expertise, it looks at people over 65. And among that population, 60% say that they are lonely regularly. As psychologists, we look at the way our connections um, with others, make us healthy, make us happy. Um, and we've done lots of research finding that our physical and psychological well being is connected to being satisfied with the relationships in our lives. So I'm going to talk first about what loneliness is, how we study it, and then some suggestions for what can be done. Um, so loneliness is a normal human feeling. All of us feel lonely some of the time, um, but when it becomes chronic loneliness, when we feel lonely most of the time, it's like hunger and thirst. If it's not satisfied, we get sick and ultimately we die. Um, people feel lonely when there is a gap between what they want in life and what they have. Of course, we all have a gap between what we want and what we have, but it depends on how big that gap is. I'm just going to stop for a minute and stop sharing and see if I can get you back. Everyone could see me, right? Okay, for some reason, I can't see anybody, but I guess it doesn't matter. Let me try one. More. There you are. I don't know what what went wrong there, but I can see you now. So, um, so um, as psychologists, we have studied neurological, cognitive, and behavioral factors, and we find that for lonely people, there is a definite decline, and I will talk more about that. The other thing that happens is that when people are lonely, they see the world as an unsafe and dangerous place. They feel that there is threat everywhere and they're very hyper vigilant looking for bad things to happen. The other thing that happens is when something is neutral, when it's not good and when it's not bad, if someone is lonely, they see all those experiences as bad. So gradually they begin to see the whole world as a negative, sad, dangerous place, which of course is not healthy. We have found that there's three kinds of loneliness, social loneliness, emotional loneliness, 
and existential loneliness. Social and emotional loneliness is connected to missing relationships, companionship. And for example, one woman I interviewed said, I keep picking up my cell phone to call somebody, but there's nobody I can call to have a conversation with. Or something happens that's even positive and they want to share it with someone and there's no one to share it with. Um, so um, uh, that's what social and emotional loneliness is. Existential loneliness goes a little bit deeper and broader, and it, 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 it focuses on our main existence and a lack of meaning in life in general. And existential loneliness is closely related to what we call social isolation. So social isolation is something that a lot of immigrants experience. They live in communities and places where um, they're not connected to the larger community. Maybe they're not connected to the, to the larger city, the larger society. They, they enjoy living there, but they don't feel they have an identity or a connection with the place that they're living. Or, or they may feel they don't belong with, they don't have a, a large family or they don't have a social group like this group where uh, you have each other a community or even the society at large. So everyone needs that feeling of belonging, not only to others, but for something larger than that. So social isolation is something that we have found among a lot of different immigrant populations, people who live in lands that are different from the ones that they were born and raised in. It's also very common among older people who maybe the world has changed and they feel like they don't know what's going on anymore or, or they're not able to keep up with the fast pace of change. So the two go together, but they're not exactly the same thing. Loneliness is linked to social isolation, but it's a little bit different. So social isolation, to summarize, is a disconnection from the larger society where we live, feeling that we're not a part of that collective society, which causes stress. And psychologists have found that it can increase anxiety and depression. Some of the factors that lead to social isolation are feeling like one is lacking cultural competence, which can be anything. It can be language. It can be understanding how something works. It can be, I got a new credit card uh, in the mail yesterday. And now in order to activate it, I had to go online and it was very complicated. Even something like that is a sense of cultural competence competence. It, it can result from feeling discrimination, discriminated against, discriminated because of age, because of gender, because of religion, ethnicity. Um, it can also be because of chronic illness. When people develop a chronic illness, they have to go into this medical system which is like a foreign country. It's like arriving at an airport where you have to learn, where do I change my money? Where's the taxi? What do I do? Chronic illness takes us to a whole new land that we have to be familiar with. Or it can come from feeling a lack of control or helplessness, maybe as a result of one or more of the other factors. So. The thing about loneliness that's important is that it is subjective. It's dependent on your personality. For one person, maybe one friend is enough and they don't want more friends. I was joking with one of my friends that we're so busy. If we're going to meet some new friends, we have to give them a questionnaire to fill out to see if we're compatible. Um, so uh, it, 
it's dependent on what your needs are. And each person has different needs. It's also important for us to know that all of us are lonely some of the time. When it becomes regular or most of the time, then we have physical and psychological health problems. And I'll talk about what some of those are in a little bit. Um, the other thing is that when people are lonely, they may feel they have no control or they feel helpless about changing their relationships. They feel that they should be grateful for any attention they get from anybody instead of saying, I want to do this and this, or can we do this and this? They, they feel they should be grateful for anyone inviting them, anyone visiting them, and, and that leads to feeling of learned helplessness. So chronic loneliness, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the research on psychological, physical, social, and cultural consequences of chronic loneliness. Psychologically, it lowers our self-esteem. You know, our self-esteem is the value we place on ourselves. It lowers our confidence, our satisfaction with our life, and it has been shown to make people more anxious and increase depression rates. Uh, one recent study I read said that more than 50% of people who are lonely become depressed. And I mean, clinically depressed, not just feeling depressed for one day. It, it decreases our ability to regulate our thoughts, our feelings, and behavior. We, it leads to losing your temper, being upset, not being able to control how you feel. And it makes people feel vulnerable. Uh, they look at life and see only the negative when people are feeling very lonely. One of the things that older people like to do, my area of specialization is looking at later life. So I will use more examples from later life than from young adulthood. Young adults are also very lonely, but my expertise is more in later life. For older people who may want to reminisce, to think about the past, to talk about stories of the past, if they're lonely, they remember more negative experiences instead of the positive experiences they had. So they end up thinking that their life has been negative all the way through. And what happens is when people are negative, we all have friends that we visit them and they talk only about negative things and how things are bad. And then um, it, it leads to self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because they see the world in a negative way, people stay away from them, treat them differently, and then it, it becomes more and more negative for them. Um, and I've already talked about higher rates of depression and suicide. Some of the physical consequences of loneliness are very shocking, actually. Uh, loneliness and isolation both increase physical health problems. Um, one of the things that they do is they make people not want to take care of themselves. They exercise less, they don't eat as carefully, they can't sleep well, they don't take care of themselves to stay healthy. Uh, some of the people who have researched heart patients have found that loneliness increases heart disease risks by 29% and 32% for stroke risk. So those are very high, that's one third. And then for people who have heart disease, um, for people who are lonely, there's a four times increased risk of dying from heart disease when you look at all other factors. And there's a 68% increased risk of hospitalization and 57% risk of emergency visits. So loneliness has serious physical consequences. 
It has also been shown to increase the uh, cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's uh, between 40 and 50% more chance for people who are lonely. And that's when you take other factors like age, gender, income, health into account. The other thing that loneliness has been related to is, and, and it's related to the earlier point that people don't take as good a care of themselves, so they gain weight. And so it's been related to obesity and uh, diabetes or pre-diabetes, which of course is another public health epidemic, uh, actually global epidemic. So in looking at some of the social consequences of loneliness, it makes us old at a younger age. It makes people feel old, look old, act quote unquote old at a younger age and leads to more susceptibility to chronic and acute illnesses. And uh, for uh, if life expectancy in the United States, for example, right now is around 80%. People who suffer from chronic illness die an average of seven years earlier uh, than, than average. And um, uh, researchers have said that the effect is like smoking, obesity, and inactivity, not exercising to, uh, all together. One study um, showed that it was similar to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it's a, it's a very serious problem. In terms of social and cultural consequences, um, it makes people disengage from activities. It might make people retire earlier. It cuts down on, for example, being active in organizations like this one, volunteer work, philanthropy, engagement in environmental causes, and it increases because of the things I've already talked about, healthcare costs and overuse of medical services. And then I'm going to talk about the toll on family and caregivers. Um, so I will talk more about what we need, but essentially what we have to do if we want to fight loneliness, the loneliness epidemic, is we need a global roadmap. We need to look at the individual and what we can do to help that person. We need to look at interpersonal relationships because as we said in the introduction, we live linked lives. We're connected to our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our brothers, sisters, cousins, families, and um, it affects everyone. Um, if you know that your 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 cousin or your grandchild or 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 a close friend is very lonely and you don't do anything, it's going to affect you and how you see yourself and who you think you are as a person. So we have to look at the interpersonal level and we have to look at the societal level, at collective things, what can be done to help people who are lonely since it is such a crisis. So, Loneliness is very widespread. It's not just among older people. It's not just among wealthy people. It's not just among poor people. It, it has many different faces. Um, these are some of my students interviewing people who volunteered for a research project on loneliness. And this was someone who had diabetes who I interviewed in Savannah last, a couple of months, a few months ago. So it takes many different forms and has many different faces. No one is immune from loneliness. Um, here is a chart that shows loneliness around the world. And you can see that most of it is between 30 and 60%. Now I was looking at this chart in an article while I was in Germany two months ago, 
And one of my students there was from Greece. And I asked him, I said, why is this percentage of, in Greece so high? And he said that many people live in small towns and villages and all of the children and grandchildren have left to go to the cities and so they miss their families and they feel lonely and they feel isolated. Um, here are some statistics from the United States. Um, as I said before, 60 to 70 percent of younger and older adults say that they feel lonely regularly. 50 to 72 percent of baby boomers, uh, those are people who are now in the 60s and 70s. Millions of Americans go five or six days without seeing or even speaking to anyone. Between those who are 75 years of age to 84 years of age, 30, 38% live alone and do not see anyone regularly. 59% of those over 85 live alone and don't see anyone. And 4 million Americans say that television is their main companion. And uh, so you can see that it's a very, very serious public health crisis. And I'm going to go over some of the situations that result in loneliness. And I have a picture of a tree trunk here because a tree is is like a person. A tree needs air, it needs water, it needs to be taken care of in order to survive. And people need all of those things as much as trees need all of those things. So these are new statistics from the United States. 25%, one in four Americans live alone. And studies have shown that for older adults who live alone, the chance of dying earlier increases. Immigrants have often dispersed families all around the world. And um, so they make up a large percentage of, of the United States population. Poverty is very high and people who live in, uh, po in poor neighborhoods often don't have the resources, they don't have transportation, they don't have the money, it may not be safe for them to go anywhere, and so they isolate in their homes. And then of course, fear of crime, um, just in 2023, almost 14,000 people have been killed by crime. So for people who are lonely already, that those statistics make them not want to leave the house and makes it worse. Um, people who have chronic uh, diseases or functional impairment, maybe they cannot hear or they, or they have trouble driving at night because they cannot see well, um, those things result in, in people self-isolating. The other thing that has happened more since COVID is that people volunteer less. And so as a result, um, people who are retired do have less to do. They're afraid of getting con of contagious, being contagious and um, so they and or they don't know what to do or and so volunteerism has declined. And then of course I'll talk more about digital life and online connections, but some of the research shows that some people spend 10 hours a day online. Um, and then um, I've done a lot of research and, and one other area of my research looks at the ways in which the environment can help us stay healthy and happy in later life. And um, there is a lot of alienation from the environment where people don't have access to green space, they don't, they don't live in neighborhoods where there are no parks, or they live in remote rural areas um, where they don't have support networks to get out. There is a campaign that I've been working on with others in the United States. It started in California called the 10 Minute Walk Campaign. And the campaign is to get everyone 
uh, out walking and to make sure everyone in 10 minutes can walk to some kind of green area. So um, that's, I, I think, a great project and hopefully it will, it will continue to take off. I wanted to talk a little bit about the theories in psychology that we have that help us explain loneliness. And um, one comes from social psychology. Social psychology looks at the person in society. And it says that when people are lonely, they have more negative interpretations of life. I've already talked about this, but they also have more negative views of relationships, of their future, of they don't see any good things in the future coming up. Another theory is related to stress and how we cope with stress. And this theory has shown that when we feel lonely, we lose our ability to cope with stress. So when something stressful happens, it has a very big impact on us, um, a, a negative impact. And then uh, social resource theory looks at the fact that people who are lonely slowly lose the resources they have, and then they have no place to turn when they need help. And finally, uh, so self-control and efficacy talks about how people lose their ability to feel that they can have an impact. So for example, uh, if you feel that you need to lose weight and exercise, um, if you ha have low self-control and self-efficacy, you think, well, no matter what I do, nothing's going to change, so I might as well not do anything. Um, another very important theory is called so socio-emotional selectivity theory. And what this theory talks about is as we go through life, we look at the future. And once we pass midlife, our perspective changes and we begin to think, okay, maybe I should focus on what I can still do with my time. What do I enjoy? What do I want to accomplish? To use the slang term, to create a new bucket list. And what happens, uh, and it's important for people to do that, to make plans that are realistic, that they can accomplish. But when people are lonely, they don't make any plans for their future. They have nothing to look forward to because of that negative outlook. So that's a very uh, dangerous kind of place to be. Um, I wanted to just briefly say that there are some problems with this research. I've been looking at loneliness for 15 years. And um, one of the problems is how do you measure loneliness? There are many instruments, but there is also a stigmatization of victim blaming. If I say I am lonely, then people look at me like, what's wrong with you? Why do people not like you? Why don't you have people in your life? So sometimes using the word lonely makes people answer in ways that that, that is not truthful because they don't want to look like like there's somehow there's something wrong with them that people don't like them. So it's victim blaming. So it makes identifying loneliness and preventing loneliness difficult because of the stigmatization that goes with it. Uh, one uh, colleague who does research on loneliness said that the stigma associated with being lonely is very similar to the stigma associated to being obese, that somehow people blame the person who is obese. They blame the person who is lonely. So that's a very serious problem for researchers like me who look at loneliness. The other thing is that if there are uh, political, ethical considerations that complicate the situation. We know that we need resources. We know that we need green space. 
We know that we need transportation. We know that those things make a difference. The politicians don't want to spend money on those things. And consequently, there is a denial of the loneliness epidemic because otherwise people have to assume responsibility and take some steps to change it. So um, helping people live healthy lives is a human rights issue. And uh, politicians often you know, prefer not to look at that or address that. I just wanted to put some questions out here that are some examples of the questions that we ask when we study loneliness. And you can see how people don't want to say, yes, I, I don't have anyone to, to be with. I feel left out. I feel isolated. So it's very difficult to measure loneliness accurately. There are also at-risk populations and at-risk situations for loneliness. Um, so the research has found that immigrants are a high-risk group for being lonely. Uh, LGBTQ individuals, maybe their families don't accept them. Society discriminates against them. Interestingly enough, older men who were very successful when they were working who retire are very much at risk because they're used to having people come to them and arrange things for them. And maybe now they have to do it themselves and they have to relearn those cultural competencies. Many minority populations, people who are victims of abuse, of course, widows often who live alone, and those who live, as I said, in poverty and unsafe neighborhoods, and those who have chronic health conditions. I've already talked about those two. So I wanted to very briefly talk about some projects and studies that I have done. Uh, we recently did a study looking at um, um, loneliness and isolation in the workplace. And we found that people who are older feel that they are more lonely and more isolated because they are discriminated against because of age discrimination. And so here are some statistics from the United States. Almost 40%, 37.3% are over 50, 15% are over 60, and 25% is going to be over 65 in the next few years. Older men and women are the fastest growing segment in the workforce, but the majority of older adults, 61% of all workers, 81% of older women experience age discrimination. And age discrimination makes people feel lonely and isolated in the workplace. Um, and uh, some studies have found that older workers are seen as less enthusiastic, less competent, less trainable, none of which is true, but those are perceptions. And that makes people self-isolate and, and not try for things because they feel that, that they're not going to be chosen anyway. Um, Older immigrants, and this is especially the case with older poor immigrants. Um, I've done some research looking at Latino immigrants in a little town near where I live uh, outside of Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, and they feel lonely because they feel they're discriminated against. They may not speak the language well, they may feel disconnected from their families that are far away, and they may not have the money to go visit them. Uh, they may have stress learning how to get by. And um, I have done some research looking at caregiving, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, they uh, do, often do not qualify or do not know how to get formal care, so they have to rely on informal care. Um, 
So that those factors increase loneliness and isolation. Um, the other thing that happens is that there is a decline in intergenerational contact. I think it's so wonderful that your organization tries to build intergenerational contact because we need more of that. Um, many children live far away from their parents and grandparents. I had a project called Intergenerational Learning Pro Program, which is on here, that was sponsored by the World Health Organization. And what we did was we paired an older adult over 60 with a young adult in the 20s. And uh, the partnership was to last for four months, and they had to meet once a week for coffee. Uh, some of those meetings could be online, but most of them had to be in person. And we evaluated loneliness and isolation, and we also looked at stereotypes of younger and older people, and we had so many positive results. It was a program that went for five years, and it was actually by the World Health Organization listed as one of the good programs for this creating livable communities. Um, the other thing that feeds into loneliness and it also can pre uh, prevent it because we're here on our computers talking but technology and living life online can increase loneliness um, i'm doing a project right now with two students and we've been interviewing people about their experiences online and how their uh how technology influences their relationships. And what we found is that when relation, when texts and emails supplement in-person visits, it, it enriches relationships. But if a child or a friend texts and then doesn't visit because they say, oh, well, I texted, then it reduces um, relationships. And normally what happens is because people are texting and communicating online, it reduces in-person contact. And so technology ends up having a negative impact, although of course it also has a positive impact. And then during COVID, of course, it was so, so wonderful to have that access. Um, the other problem with technology is technology addiction is on the rise. And when I talk about this with my students, I tell them to leave their cell phone at home for one day and see how they feel. And they get very nervous and very anxious because they have a fear of missing out. They, they, they have negative, they tend to negatively compare themselves with Instagram and um, they, it leads to decreased social interaction. And then the other thing that happens is people get so used to, um, I just gave a talk um, two weeks ago in person to a big group and it was the, the first in-person talk to like more than 100 people that I had given in two years because they'd been on Zoom. And for the first few minutes, I was very nervous because I thought, I don't know how to do this anymore. It's been two years, three years since I've done this. Um, so it increases anxiety about in-person situations. Um, and it also makes people feel anxious when they're not connected. And then um, caregivers, most of you, most of us are caregivers in some way. Um, Rosalind Carter said that there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are now caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need care. So each of us is going to fall in those categories. And caregivers have very, very high rates 
of isolation and loneliness. I wrote a paper called My Life in Solitary Confinement because that was what one woman said her life felt like while she was caring for her husband before he died. So there are more than 40 million Americans who provide care. 75% of those are women. Most of those women are over 65. And often when they're caregiving, they cannot take care of themselves. Um, they, they, they let their own health deteriorate. So it's a very stressful uh, situation that often leads to uh, loneliness and anxiety. So what are some solutions? Um, what are some things that, that the research says works? And I hope that you will come up with some solutions as well. Um, one, of course, is a religious or spiritual connection. Most people now uh, no longer be uh, belong to an organized religion. Most people see themselves as more spiritual, or if they do belong to an organized religion, they don't necessarily go to a church or have a church community. But spirituality and religion still provides a very important source of support for people who are lonely and isolated. My own research has looked at ecotherapy and the natural connection to something greater in the world, to nature and the healing power of nature, which is very important. And then lifestyle factors and nurturing the self, engaging in rituals that are comforting. And then um, the I call it the four R's, which is avoiding rumination, which is continuous thinking about the negative circumstances that you're in, altering, increasing healthy thinking, making plans, taking control. Also, one of the things that my students and I have found is that people often don't express their needs. Their families may not know that people are lonely. They may not know that people feel depressed because, because they feel isolated. So expressing yourself is, is important adapting, recognizing that change is a part of life and that we all feel lonely sometimes. And as we get older, we do lose people and we will go through those periods, but we can come out on the other side and accepting that it's not our fault that we do not need to feel stigmatized because we feel lonely. So the other thing that just to emphasize the four R's focus on what the person can do um, as a, as a in, we need a global roadmap also for health that includes ways that people can engage at every age and with every background and then I mentioned that I had helped write this UN Decade of Healthy Aging Goals. Part of that is to combat loneliness and to create communities where people can be engaged and they can be cared for. So I think that's an, uh, it's, it's a personal issue, it's a family issue, but it's also a, 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 a policy and a global issue. So, um, that is the end. Those are my suggestions, and that is my overview. I would like to hear uh, questions or suggestions. I'll